All right, Delia, let's go. Okay. Good uh, morning. Yeah, good morning. Delia Fernandez is I've been working with for over 25 years. You don't look at Delia. <laughs> Uh, she's a fee-only financial advisor, and as we do with all of our um, our guest presenters, well, let's go through your Ask First form. Okay, let me pull it up on the screen. There you go. All right, you have a master's or other advanced degree. What is that in? That's a master's in business administration. That's and so you don't get that overnight, right? You have no. to. Took me a requires a little years. bit of work. And that's why we call it a credential. Your other credential is a CFP. What is a CFP? A uh, certified financial planner, which is a designation that requires um, eight classes of study. It requires a five hour exam. It requires three years of experience to use the CFP designation supervised by another CFP. It requires 15 hours of continuing education every year. And every two years, that has to include two hours of, um, of um, oh my gosh, the word just went out of my head, of code of ethics. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good word to lose. <laughs> not a good word to lose. Sorry about that. I was on a roll and I forgot. It. <clears throat> and you've been in the business 26 years. Yes. Um, so I got you when you were brand new. Brand new. I know. So... <clears throat> You also teach financial planning uh, at UCI. So yes, in the same program I graduated from. So uh, congratulations. Relevant licenses, you don't have any, why? Because as a fee-only advisor, we don't have licenses per se. We register with our regulator, which for me is the state of California. So, and then if you, uh, which, uh, how much do you have under management at the present time? I have about $48 million. Okay. And so when you go to the national <laughs> level, uh, is that $100 million or It is. And that's when instead of being regulated by your respective state, you go to the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is on the federal level. Okay. So if I plug you in on broker check, remember broker check, if I plug your name in, Will you come up under and will the broker check guide me to the Securities and Exchange Commission website? It'll it'll take you to the website where my form ADV, disclosure documents, any other regulatory issues would come up. It's just the same no matter what level we are. Okay, so in broker check, I could put your license number in right. uh, where you have your registration number, actually, or I can put your name in. Yes. Yes, and everybody needs to know that if an advisor is soliciting your business, you can go to their website. They are required to put that broker check link right on their website. You know, I haven't seen that for mm -hmm. many of them. I, I see a very few. Um, it's just the registration. Everything in the financial services industry operates on full disclosure. So um, if uh, let's scroll down a little bit, Delia. Sure. All right. It says business relationship uh, that you put true on there. What does I it did. mean to be a fiduciary? Means I put my, I have to put under law, put my client's best interests ahead of my own. So you would be held liable if you put your own interests first. That's right. And then what is that different than from a broker? A broker might feel that they, well, they, under the law, they might be able to offer you some, something that is suitable for you to invest in, but isn't exactly in your best interest. So, you know, if I look at a client's situation and I feel the best thing for them to do with their money is pay off their high interest credit cards instead of invest with me, that's what I'm going to tell them to do. Okay. Now, it's, this is kind of subtle, but um, our uh, it says ways I will be paid. So let's talk about that first. How do you charge your clients? Um, I charge my clients either an hourly rate for hourly financial planning advice, which a lot which of people- Which is what? what? How much is that? 
Uh, I charge $275 an hour for the time that we meet face to face and typically $150 to prepare. Okay. And then um, how do you charge as far as an ongoing client? Um, if a client wants me to manage their money and stay involved in their finances, I charge by assets under management, which is the amount of money that they bring to me to invest for them and to oversee. And I typically charge 1% a year on the first half million, um, 80 basis points or 0 0.80 on the next half million, and then one half of 1% on the amount over that. Okay. And then um, uh, do you offer a free a review of uh, a person's financial plan or finances? Well, this people can certainly come in to talk to me for free about how we might work together and what are some of the things that they might consider addressing for their finances. Okay. Um, certainly if they want to do that. All righty. And then uh, once they're in, uh, you engage them, uh, how did they get rid of you? Um, if I were managing their money, they can simply call TD Ameritrade where I open the accounts and they can say, disconnect that limited power of attorney and I'm gone. Um, and of course, if it's an hourly appointment, then you know when we're done, we're done, although they're welcome to come back. Yeah, so give us a kind of an idea of why somebody would come in to see you on an hourly basis. You know, a lot of people love the idea of just checking in with a planner to get some expertise on where they are now in their financial life, whether they're getting ready to retire, sending their kids to college, they want to buy a home, um, they're trying to settle a family's estate and they want some help on the financial side because they also have attorney that they're working with and an accountant. Um, I can help walk them through some processes and do some projections on well, how much money it's going to take to meet their goals. Now, that's okay. really important. Uh, we yeah. need to consider rates of return on investment, inflation, how much they can save, what it costs them to live. All those components have to be put together. Okay. Um, I also see that as probably when one spouse dies and then the surviving spouse may need some help or Absolutely. somebody is planning on retiring. And so they're not sure exactly what to do. I would also recommend they see you before they give money to their children. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so, you put that oxygen mask on yourself first before yeah, you put it on anybody else, right? Exactly. So this is kind of subtle as well. Uh, uh, do you, well, uh, do you uh, get any compensation any other way except from your client? No, no, I don't. So for example, TD Ameritrade or other providers like mutual funds or exchange traded funds may have webinars or educational materials. Um, prior to COVID, we might be invited to a lunch or a conference. Um, so, you know, I may be given an opportunity to eat a free lunch, but oh, okay. um, I otherwise don't get paid by anybody okay. else. And then it on the form, it says payment will be made by so the, the client pays you, your only obligation is to your client. That's it. Nobody it's else clean, pays clean, simple, and no problem. All righty. So then, and then you're, don't, you're not affiliated with anyone who uh, sells stuff. And yeah. you said you're, uh, explain what a custodian is and how important that is. Oh, when somebody wants me to manage their money, it's very important that we have a third party separate from me, who holds the money, whose custody is that money. We call them a custodian. I use TD Ameritrade. Uh, the important thing about that is that it is not me telling you that I'm managing your money and issuing the statements to show you how much money you have. I mean, if you remember Bernie Madoff's story, that's what he did was he said, oh, I'm managing your money right here at the Bernie Madoff securities firm. Well, no, he wasn't. So what's very important about an objective, separate third party custodian is that you have a relationship with them and you can check your money at all times. I only have a limited power of attorney. I can't go in and say, oh, this money is now all mine. Um, I might be able to charge a quarterly fee on that account if you approved it as a client, but I'm not allowed to take that account and put my name on it. I mean, it's not my money. Yeah. A question, uh, a question, Pete, a question's come up. We've other other presenters have talked about using Schwab or Fidelity. Why don't people use Vanguard? 
Um, Vanguard does not work with professionals anymore. They used to about 26 years ago to have us custody money at Vanguard. But a lot of us will buy Vanguard exchange traded funds and mutual funds as part of investing client money. Thank so you. when clients come to me hourly, I'm perfectly, perfectly eager to tell them to go directly to Vanguard to manage their money. So um, let's see where I was going to ask a question. <laughs> I forgot what I was going to ask. Was it about the code of ethics? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's go into uh, uh, your presentation. Sure. Let's go take a look at the presentation. Um, oh, I know what I was going to ask. It yes. has come back. Yes. Uh, how many clients do you have? I have about 48 clients who are assets under management. And then I have appointments, hourly appointments every year of somewhere around 150. Yeah. So uh, as compared to a broker, which has usually somewhere between three to 6,000 clients, yeah. um, why don't you expand that uh, presentation? And I see yeah. you, but I don't see the presentation. I know, let me get to that screen. <laughs> Does that look okay? Not yet. Oh, it's, I know it takes a minute for it to cook. Yeah, there it goes. Okay. All right. Uh, well, there's Delia, her address, phone number, and email address. Let's go to the next slide. Um, oh, that's right. This uh, works a little differently on. Um, I forgot that this works a little bit differently on. Oh, here we are. Today's topics. Okay. So you see today's topic screen? Yes. Good. Yes, I just remembered that on this kind of version of Zoom, I have to do something different to change slides. We're all becoming more technically. Uh, <laughs> yes, we are. Fine. Yes, we are. Yeah. Today's topics. You know, there's we certainly may not get through all of this because the financial planning section is in two pieces, but I always like to start with risk management, which really is another way of saying insurance. Because if we don't protect what you have now and what you're going to build, then any other discussion is, is kind of hopeless. Uh, because somebody could take, your, could take your assets away from you in a minute if you don't have enough insurance. So that to me is really critical. But then as Pete pointed out at the top of the presentation, tax planning is such an integral part of anything that we decide to do with your finances because we're gonna go on and talk about investments and retirement and estate planning, but we need to get the basics on where you are with your tax situation. Yeah, within the investment planning and the retirement planning, we're gonna get more into that next week. So, uh, but this is one presentation. So uh, we'll, and we'll discuss just a little bit of the estate planning at the end of uh, today's session. So let's go into the next slide and talk a little bit about risk management. By the way, when you talk about risk management and you refer somebody to another insurance agent, uh, do you get a kickback from that insurance agent? No. You don't? No, I've had them offer too. I've yeah. had them call me not understanding the relationship and I have to explain it to them. Yeah. So, um, but I, risk management is absolutely important. It's critical. It's one of the first things I do when I start talking to people, I'm putting together, as we've talked about in the past, and we'll talk about a balance sheet or a net worth statement to figure out what kind of protection they need. Yeah. And then I'm gonna zero in on whether they're adequately protected. Yeah, well, health insurance is your first topic on there and we're right now in open enrollment. So <clears throat> one of the big things is, is, is that who should, who should I go with as far as, health coverage is concerned if you're retired. Exactly. And is, yeah, and this is the time period where you can do this. We're gonna spend on um, medical care planning an entire hour and a half. So, uh, but this is open enrollment. So see your insurance agent and to discuss with them as to who has the best coverage for your particular ailments or for your particular prescription drugs. Every year that changes depending on the company that you're with. The good news 
in this area is that the government has established that all insurance agents who deal with health insurance get paid the same commission no matter which company they recommend. Nice. So uh, it's not commission driven as to the company that they're going to recommend to you. So don't fall in love with your health insurance company. Have your health insurance check out um, your prescription drugs. Who gives you the best copay or the least amount of copay for your particular um, uh, ailments? Uh, talk a little bit how about homeowners and auto and personal liability. Why is that so important? Oh my gosh, um, this is where I think people can have the biggest impact on protecting themselves is to make sure that they have adequate auto liability insurance, adequate homeowners liability. Certainly we want enough coverage on our homes so that if it were damaged or burned to the ground, we could rebuild it. And that's something we need to keep up with all the time. Our homes have gone up in value. We need to review our insurance to make sure it's keeping up with the value of the home. And then the personal liability insurance is to give us an additional amount of personal liability, which is really critical these days. Again, as, our, as we get older, our net worth grows. If we own a house, if we own investments, we may be surprised at how much our net worth actually is. So you have a slide on the umbrella yeah. policy. Uh, there it is. So here's what I like people to think about we're our auto and our homeowners are first in line to protect us. So in this example, I've shown you an auto policy with 250,000 per person of liability insurance. If you, the driver, um, are liable for an accident and up to half a million per incident. And then it also has the same amount if you're hit by an uninsured or underinsured motorist. Um, and we don't have any of those in Southern California, right? On the homeowner's side, I have a certain amount for residence itself. Just if you think about the square footage of your house, go and divide it into your dwelling coverage or residence coverage. And then I have half a million of liability. But if I have a client with a net worth of over half a million, I'm going to need them to have more liability coverage. This is really critical. So the insurance industry has a way to solve this problem, and they do it with a third policy that they call a personal umbrella liability policy, but a lot of us just refer to it as an umbrella. It is sold in million dollar increments. So in this example, my client has a million dollars, let's say they have a million dollars of, a, of a, an umbrella policy, and that means that if they had something happen to them on the auto side, they'd be covered for a million and a half. And the same thing on the homeowners. If somebody slipped and fell in their yard or otherwise sued them for a homeowner's liability, they'd be covered for a million and a half. But and it's no very talking, inexpensive. Very inexpensive. If you had two cars, that $1 million umbrella could be around $400 a year. Yeah. However, you're going to need to raise your underlying coverage on the automobile coverage in California if it's not at least 250 and five you're going to need to raise it to that in order to get the umbrella. Yeah, and it, it ranges between 300 to $600 for every million dollars worth of coverage, but it's probably one of the best ways to protect yourself. It's a great and, thing. It is pure legal defense, pure yeah. legal defense. And, and then the other thing too is, you know, with the fires that we have going mm. and the floods, um, replacing your home value I mean, I live in Laguna Beach. There's fires in people's homes here. And you have to have replacement value as far as your home is concerned. Um, because, I mean, the price of lumber just recently wow. has just gone sky high. And so you, we don't know what that cost is. So Now, that's uh, a really good tip. You should check with your agent. Because I had an agent tell me with some San Diego fires a long time ago, not only was the fire so vast that it burned the house to the ground, but it actually melted the foundation. Wow. So you may have to rethink how much coverage you have on the residents and remember that they also have to spend money to haul the uh, debris away. And yeah. then you may need money for temporary living arrangements until the house is rebuilt. 
You know, I always think of when we talk about this particular section of the financial planning process about medical doctors and medical doctors, Hippocratic oath is do no harm. And I think for fin fee only financial advisors is make sure no harm comes to you. <laughs> That's a good way of reversing it. Exactly right. Yeah, you know, so, uh, so protect your, and most individuals believe that when they go and see a fee only financial planner, that we're, you're only going to look at the investment portion. Mm. But no, that's... Uh, we, you know, when we're trying to approach things in a comprehensive way, and sometimes clients come in and they say, I only want to look at this one narrow part. But, yeah. you know, when I go to the doctor and I may have a pain in my side, they want to weigh me. And yeah. I'm like, no, don't weigh me. I've got a pain in my side. But obviously they're looking at the whole picture and ideally, that's what we're trying to do if you're, if you're willing to sit through it to help you figure out how safe you really are in a comprehensive way. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of things that you had on your uh, topics for the day is long-term care insurance, which we're not going to talk about today, but it's really important because the cost of long-term care is, you know, gone shoot, shoot through the roof. And so we need a little bit of a nest egg to make sure that we're covered for that. But that brings me to a really important topic. And that is, why do people have to know their net worth? Oh, we have to know our net worth, first of all, to make sure that we have adequate insurance to protect ourselves. So um, I wanna know what you're worth so I can protect you, but we also need to know your net worth because it can have an impact on all sorts of other things, including where you invest your money, where we recommend you invest your money, um, some impact on taxes, depending on where the money is. Um, but first and foremost, I wanna protect what you have and what you're going to have. And that's why I build a net worth statement. Yeah, and so um, do people know when they come into you what their net worth is? No, they typically don't. They're often surprised. Um, it's, it's like one of those things where I didn't know I was a millionaire or I had no idea I, have, I was worth a million and a half, yeah. uh, two million dollars. They're just yeah. shocked. So go, go to the next slide. But well, as we talk a little bit more about net worth, uh, uh, because one of the things, you know, risk management on life insurance, how much is enough? And it's based on net worth. It sure is. And it's based on what your goals and objectives are for your heirs. I mean, who are you trying to protect? Who do you need to support? Who's going to be harmed financially if you die? Um, at much higher levels of net worth, you may want life insurance to protect against estate taxes. Um, so it really is all tied in together. Yeah. So you should know your net worth almost like your birthday. You That's know. a good point. Yeah. Um, how about uh, why do we need to review old life insurance policies? Well, life insurance policies may be, <clears throat> if they're a term policy, they may be coming due or maturing sooner than you thought. So you have to coordinate any extended coverage you may need that, that you hadn't thought about. I have, I'll tell you the area where a lot of people get in trouble is they buy life insurance in their 20s and maybe they have a 20 year policy. And then when they get into their 40s, they realize, you know, the kids are still in the home. I want to help out the kids on, on other levels of their life. And I need to extend that life insurance to be sure that I'm covered for those other goals. So I think when people fall asleep on their life insurance, particularly term policies, they forget to figure out whether they have enough. The other kind of life insurance, the kind that builds up cash value, we need to examine whether there is any cash in it. And really important, we need to go to that company and our agent and see how that policy is running. How is it performing? Is that premium going to stay the same for the rest of my life? Or is there a chance that the insurance company is gonna to need to raise that premium? Yeah. I don't like surprise letters that say, oh, by the way, you know, that $100 a quarter premium is now turning into $250. So what's called an in-force illustration, when you go to your company and say, send me an in-force illustration and tell me how well this is, this is working. Um, and then talk to your agent about it, about the prospect that maybe, maybe your policy needs to uh, 
be reworked because it's not working for you. It's going to be too expensive. So when you do this kind of a work for your client, is that included in your fee uh, with assets under management? Yes. Any kind of financial planning would be included with assets under management fees. So, so and, and I forgot to ask you, do you have any kind of a minimum? If, uh, if I give you $100,000 uh, to invest in, so that would cost me personally $1,000 a year you would go through my insurance and help me out in that sure, regard? Sure, As part of a quarterly meeting, as part of an ongoing relationship, I'd, I'd be asking about it and want to know where it is and be putting yeah. it on the schedule to review with you. Yeah. Uh, I just saw an old annuity in one of my clients' accounts and it was paying 3.5% um, annually. Uh, it's one of the reasons why you don't want to act uh, unless you fully understand yeah. what you have. So uh, make sure you just kind of review it before you do anything. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so I think most of the individuals here um, uh, attending the program have retired. Yes. Um, and don't have dependents unless they, you know, their adult children have moved back into the home. And that's a whole nother story. It sure is. <laughs> so, uh, um, but uh, I, uh, so, but just in general, in term, in, in between term and cash value insurance, what do you usually recommend to your younger clients? Well, I usually recommend term insurance because it's less expensive and you can get marvelous, really, you know, million dollar coverage is not that expensive anymore. Um, and you can get it and fix it for 20 to 30 years. And I need to point out a technicality is that technically all life insurance is term insurance in the sense that we all die sometime, right? So the insurance ends sometime. Yeah. But the cash value policies are the ones that are supposed to go for your entire life, charge you a higher premium so that there's some cash buildup at some time. Yeah. But yeah, I want my younger people to lock in really good term policies young when it's cheap and to get as much as they think they may need. Yeah. And sometimes the life insurance is used as an estate planning tool. But again, that's a more of a sophisticated planning tool. So let's move on to the next slide. Ah, tax planning. But before we get to tax planning, I want to talk a little bit more about net worth. Sure. Um, yeah, because uh, people should at least put on a pad or on a, on a sheet of paper all of their assets, how they hold title to those assets, cost basis, what, what is cost basis? What does that mean, the technical definition of that? Uh, for tax planning purposes, it's the original cost of that asset, whether it was you purchased it or whether it was gifted to you while somebody was alive, maybe your aunt or grandmother handed you or your parents handed you some shares of stock. Um, if it is in a taxable account, not a retirement account, but a taxable account, or if it's an asset outside of an investment account, like a home or a rental property, and you may someday sell it, Uncle Sam is gonna to wanna to know, well, did you make a profit? What was your difference between the sales price and the cost basis? So we need to know that. Yeah, so everybody should know from their asset what their cost basis is and what the market value is, all of their assets. Yes. And so, you add up all the market value of your assets, subtract it from whatever you owe. Do people know exactly kind of what they owe? No, they tend to know their monthly payments or their quarterly payments, but they don't really know what the balance is. So it's, it's a very nice thing to update your balance and update your net worth statement. Yeah, and no, so you subtract your liabilities from your market value of your assets, and you have a number there. And that number is so important. You know, the other number is that is really important uh, to Delia is, is, is that she wants to know when you're going to die. <laughs> I like to say to do really good planning, I need to know the exact date of your death, but that's, that's pretty silly. 
Well, um, and it shows I, the uncertainty involved in planning. Well, but I mean, like, say, for instance, if you have a one million dollar estate and you've got 20 years to live, I can divide 20 into a million and say I got X number of dollars to live on on an annual basis until I die. Is that how financial planning works? Not exactly, um, because there are some other functions in there we have to insert, some variables such as inflation, because that's one of the biggest dangers for retirees is inflation. And we have to figure out how much those assets are appreciating or going up in value. What's the rate of return on those assets? And of and course- how much are we gonna pay in taxes? How much are we gonna pay in taxes? And some of those assets are not that liquid, like it's hard to break off a piece of your house and eat it. Um, you can get a reverse mortgage, but it's not that easy to say, I'm gonna live off my house unless you sell it, then you still have to have a place to live. So what's yeah. that cost? But basically, um, uh, uh, do you need to know the age? Of course. How, how many years is to, left to live? Because one of the people's biggest concerns is, is, is that running out of money. Yes. And, and that fear doesn't drive people to kind of examine that. So how do you, how do you put all the tax issues, the inflation, uh, the net worth? How do you how do you put all that together to make people comfortable that they have enough to live on or they're overreaching and they need to slow down a little bit? Well, we all have software that we use that helps us organize that material, tap that information about assets, about what you owe, about what rate of return you're getting and what inflation is, and to project that out based on what we think your costs are going to be for basic cost of living, long-term care, helping out the kids, gifting money. Um, all of that is what we have to integrate into software and work with the client to figure out if we're on path. Okay. And so that's kind of what financial planning is all about. It's exactly what it's all about. And you know, you set a plan and then you monitor and adjust as needed. You know, the plan is not something written in stone that you have to live by the rest of your life. Clients call me all the time and say, you know, we saw you a year and a half ago, but boy, have things changed. We just got an inheritance. Um, we just we decided to house, move. Yeah. Decided to move. Exactly. Yeah. Our yeah. kids all moved, things. so we moved, you know? Yeah, exactly. But at least you have it down on a plan. Yes. And so you can put together a worst case scenario, a likely scenario, and an optimistic scenario, or you can do a lot of what ifs. That's exactly it. You know? That's exactly, because once clients understand how the software works, they really engage and get excited. They're like, okay, I've had, you know, one client turns to the other and says, okay, I think we should be able to buy that second home. Let's figure out what that vacation home would cost and whether it fits in our plan. You know, it reminds me of Carl's uh, um, uh, presentation or just uh, his discussion on just blood pressure uh. and how you need to monitor that on a regular basis. And so to see whether or not it's any sign of getting into trouble. So yes. are clients, when they, when they engage you, are they limited to the number of times that they can contact you or to run a scenario? No, so an hourly client may choose to come in to set up that base plan uh -huh. and, what, and to project out where they think they're going. And then they may, they may check in with me annually or as needed. And, and I have several, that's what they do is they say, oh my gosh, things have changed. Okay. Here's how we have to rerun it. Um, let me come in and we can review it together. So, so uh, one of the things that we discussed have already that, you know, we can, we can control the fees, the, uh, we can control potential losses. Um, so taxes, mm -hmm. uh, let's get, go into that. What is a, what is a deduction and what is a standard deduction and what is an itemization? Yeah, so an itemization, there's some things under law, like our interest on our mortgage um, and other expenses that could be pulled together and deducted from our gross income for tax purposes. 
Can but you couple, pull up? Can yes. You pull up Let me that, pull uh, up that tax. Uh, yeah, that tax that's form. a handy little thing. I'm going to go here, and then I'm going to switch to the next page. So this is another thing that everybody needs to know is besides their net worth is what income tax bracket are you in? So for example, on the right-hand side of your screen, you see married filing jointly, single. So let's say I'm gonna be a single guy and um, I see my bracket is in the, um, uh, so my first, dollars that I earn up to $9,950 is uh, my tax is zero on that. Yes. So as soon as I make over $10,000 for that particular year, I jump into the 12% bracket. That's right. Okay. Let's say I'm a single guy and I made third. Thirty thousand dollars in this uh, by December, and I have an opportunity. I'm over seventy-two and a uh, years old, and I need to with I uh, need to withdraw monies. Should I take out my required minimum distribution, or should I try to take out more? Well, I would say take out more. I would say you have an opportunity as a single person in the one of the lowest tax brackets to fill up that tax bracket. You know, we like to have our money growing for us and we like to defer taxes, but actually we don't think you're ever going to be in a lower tax bracket based on today's laws. Uh, we know that the current tax laws are going to sunset at the end of 2025 and go back to the, to the previous uh, tax um, brackets, which were higher. And we know that it makes a lot of sense to take advantage of this low bracket right now. Yeah. So um, um, the, if you look at the single and the married filing jointly, um, look at the differences in income taxes. So if you have a spouse uh, that dies in any one year, mm -hmm. you may want to do a little bit of tax planning in the rest of that year just to make sure, because now all of a sudden you're gonna file as a single person versus uh, married filing jointly. So there's some things you can do there. Let's scroll down all the way down to the bottom and look at the capital gains tax rate. Uh, a little further down. Um, well, I see it at the top of the page on the right-hand side, capital gains and qualified it's, dividends. Uh, I think it's down a little further on the left-hand okay. side. Um, or were you thinking of the standard deductions? No. Uh, go down a little bit further. And... Cap capital gains was at the top. She, she, was, she was correct. Capital gains. Okay. I had capital gains right here. Capital gains and qualified dividends. But let me, okay. let me stop you for just a minute. Is it possible that you could put this form on our materials page? Of course. Do you want me to do that now? Or you want me to email it to you so you can do it? You, you can. You, after we're all done, you can put it there because people yeah. have asked for a copy of this. So if you could sure. just put it on the materials page, send it to Peter, whoever, and we can get that on for this week or next week. Okay. Uh, uh, so if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, just, just do me a favor <laughs> and go to, yes. And there we go further down. Are you looking for standard deduction? Uh, no, further down, further down, go down. Okay, and go there, go to the left. Uh, and now the other way. <laughs> this is the farthest Look, left. Scroll up a little bit. <laughs> All right. Um, and one little bit more. A little bit more. A little bit more. <laughs> a little bit more. Okay, a little bit more. I just want everybody to see all the good information that's here. Oh, okay. Yeah. All righty. So the personal uh, the capital gains tax deduction. How much can a married couple have in capital gains income and not pay any tax? 
Oh, here we are, married filing jointly up to $80,800. So when you manage your portfolio, do you try to work through capital gains or ordinary income? Oh, if it's a taxable portfolio, I love to look at capital gains. And, and of course, this is also a chart for so-called qualified dividends from stocks or mutual funds or exchange traded funds. They're taxed similar ways. So what I like to do is, is especially about this time of year, but you could do it throughout the year when a client needs money, is we take a look at those capital gains they haven't taken yet. We call that unrealized capital gains because you haven't realized them as income. You haven't made it happen. So I take a look at how much they have that have been, that have been gains and how much they have that could have been losses. We match short-term gains to losses, long-term gains to long-term losses. We can sell off enough of both sides so that they neutralize each other. They just count each other off and um, wipe each other out. And I can pull money out of that account for the client with no tax impact, none. Yes. And that's something we can control. And Absolutely. In sim and similarly, remember the scenario that I, we gave just a little bit ago of me taking an extra $10,000 out for the year I actually could take out more because my standard deduction, uh, if you look at the little box over on the left-hand side, my standard deduction as a single person is $12,400. And so over that- Over 2021 this year, it's 12,550. Yeah, so that comes right and reduces my income again. Instead of 40,000, it drops it back under 30. Yes. Yes, so it's a wonderful thing. And if you're over 65, you get to add a little bit more to it, $1,700. Yeah. So, so those are the kind of things that we look at together. So, yeah, so there's a lot of things, you know, we fee-only financial advisors charge 1%. Uh, your average broker charges like 3% per year, but it's very difficult to tell how they charge. But this is where the value comes in. This is how uh, you are getting much more in return than you are actually paying. Just to, to have your investment portfolio to be tax efficient, tax -wise. People will tell me all the time how much they enjoy investing in their taxable accounts. And I'll say to them, well, what are you doing about capital losses or capital gains? And they say, oh, I don't think about it. And I said, well, you know, you can take 3,000 a year of losses without having any offsetting gains. I mean, and, and you know, if you saw that on the sidewalk, you'd bend over and pick it up. But people aren't doing this. They're not mm -hmm. reviewing these accounts. And if you're already taking RMDs and you don't need that required all that money from the required minimum distribution, you're typically handing it over to your investment account, your taxable investment account, where this becomes all the more important. Yeah. And again, um, it, it's, it, it, it's become so important to uh, understand what your goals and objectives are, you know? So uh, are you planning on wanting to leave money to your children and live on the minimum amount, which I don't recommend, but um, if, are you planning on making gifts to the children? Are you planning on making uh, large trips for yourself or with the kids or are you planning on purchasing a rental home? I, uh, your financial advisor has to know what your goals and objectives are. For my younger clients um, who aren't 70 and a half yet, and they have taxable investment accounts, we gift shares of highly appreciated assets to their charities every year, whether it's to church or temple or any other charities, the Heart Association, we spin off some of those highly appreciated investments and gift them directly. Let's uh, go back to your uh, back to your presentation. Sure. We're going to put this chart on the materials page. Sure. So let me go back here. So today, so we just to kind of briefly review. We talked about the importance of knowing your network. Uh, what we haven't talked about yet is your spending. 
do you need to know what a person spends on an annual basis? Yes, and the secret is the majority of people do not know what it costs them to live. They don't know. They do, might you know be able do you to need to know to the penny? No, I don't want to I tell you. I don't need to know to the penny, but I need to know within about five or six thousand um, dollars. So if I'm if I'm married and we come into you, do you know we have a hard time talking about how we spend money? And I think my spouse spends way more than she should, and she feels probably the same way about me. Oh, yeah. So I heard you... stories about guys going off to buy a new tool for the garage and they come in with it in a paper bag and they hide it. <laughs> Women do the same thing, maybe with whatever else we're buying, like shoes. So we're um, not totally honest about our spending. May not be. But you need to know that, right? I need to know it. And I may have to become a bit of a financial detective. I'm going to take, you know, how much money are you getting from your pensions and your social security? Let me look at your tax return. Let me back into some numbers. Do you have any spending that's hanging over at the end of the month on credit cards or home equity line that you can't pay off? That's a clue. That's a canary in the coal mine. Uh, that tells me a story. You know, why yeah. aren't we paying this off? So, so knowing, because as far as spending is concerned, uh, you have to make sure that have sufficient assets that are generating enough income to meet the spending. Exactly. Can they afford to actually spend what they're spending? That's the number one thing. Um, or, because we got to support them before we can support any other goals, such as helping out the kids or giving to charity. Or, or could, should they be spending more? And I have some people that I say, please spend, please spend some more money. Wouldn't you like to go on a trip? Wouldn't you like to give some money to your kids or to charity? Don't you, you want to fix up the house? Because you're saying that they have very little risk if they spend a little bit more of running out of money. Oh, absolutely. The older we get, the, you know, a lot of times people have been investing for a long time. The market has been very, very good to us. And I will see people in their early 80s and 90s. They've got all sorts of money. They'll never be able to spend it. They'll never use it all on long term care. Yeah. And that's the purpose of money, isn't it? To, yes. to be used, whether it's for education, whether it's for gifting, whether it's for uh, buying toys, uh, you know, make the economy work. As, as Bush once said, that if you're a true American, you go out and spend. <laughs> uh, let's go to the next slide. I believe that changed. Here, retirement planning. Yeah, well, let's we'll we'll we're going to talk a little bit more about investment planning and retirement planning. I think most individuals are retired, and we kind of covered. Uh, uh, we we've been talking about this. Yeah, but but talk a little bit about what inflation, what role inflation plays. <sighs> inflation is one of the major enemies of retirees. Um, you know, a lot of us can probably sit around and talk about what our, what our house cost us, our first house or our first car, or we can remember what our parents might have paid for their house or their car. Inflation will eat up your ability to support yourself. It'll eat up your assets. If your investments are not keeping up with inflation, you're going to be living on a lot less and you're going to be living at a lower level in the future because you haven't done anything to keep up with inflation. And, and I realize that this can be a dilemma for clients because as they approach retirement and start retirement, they come to me and say, I am so worried that I sold everything and I put it in cash. And I'm like, that is not gonna protect you against inflation. You are currently moving backwards. You are moving backwards. And they say, but where can I go and what can I do to be safe with my money? And I think they all have the memory of an 8 or 10% CD. And those are gone. Those are gone. And even then, they might not have been keeping up with inflation. They just felt better about the rate of return they were getting. Is so one of the hardest things for you to do is to gauge the risk uh, that a client is willing to take to get the return that they request or understanding the risk that they're taking? 
It's absolutely one of the hardest. Um, after figuring out what it costs them to live, it can be the toughest thing to do next because especially at the start of retirement, people are petrified. Um, I remember a friend who took social security early because she said I was retiring early and I was so afraid I wouldn't have enough money. And she says now three years later, I know I should have waited because by waiting her social security would have gotten larger and she would have had more money to spend. But it's hard. It's hard for people sometimes to admit to their, themselves how afraid they are of what could happen to their money. So they just want to put it right there in front of them in a pile and, and look at it all the time. And I'm like, well, no, we need yeah. to put it to work. Yeah. Our last session is going to be money in your mind. And, it, you know, and it talks about how fear uh, plays a role in our, um, in our, in our investment decisions because we're all feel fearful of losing money. But uh, when we talk about uh, risk in the financial world, uh, are we talking about losing money or are we talking about volatility? And yeah, we're talking, the difference? We're, we're talking about both. So actually losing money is that you sell something and it actually is worth less than what you bought it for. You have a capital loss, but other people, may be perfectly fine in their portfolio, but they can't stand the ride. They can't stand how volatile it is. So we have to find a point where we're investing their money at a rate that will give them some comfort over and above inflation without giving them such a wild ride that they get off the ride altogether. And, like that to, meet, and meets their spending needs. And meets their spending needs. I and like their to goal. Joke, yes, because you know when I go to Disneyland, you know, I could, I could go through the same length of space by using Space Mountain, or I could take that little train around the park where all the grandmas are with the grandkids, and I'm that train around the park. I, you know, I don't want too much craziness, but we have to have enough to meet your goals and objectives for spending and anything else that you want to do in your life. So and you, you know, can't... we may have to change your plan if you can't take more risks. Yeah. So... So, so we need to know the spend, your net worth. We need to understand what tax bracket you're in. Uh, um, uh, we need to understand how much risk you're willing to take. We need to know when you're going to die. <laughs> kind of. How long do you have your clients live, by the way? Um, I typically start with a life expectancy of age 90, um, and then uh, the client comes in and we talk about it. And some of my clients have health conditions that they know they're not going to live that long. They have family history. They know they're not going to live that long. And then I had a client come in and say that they just celebrated their father's 100th birthday with them. And um, they went out and played doubles tennis. And I'm like, oh, we've got to change this life expectancy. We've got to yeah. stretch that out. And what do you what kind of a number do you use for inflation uh, in uh, when you're doing projections? I'm tending to use right now two and a half to three percent. Um, Is everybody's inflation number the same? Uh, not exactly, because it really depends on what your spending is. For example, if you had caregiving or high medical costs, your inflation definitely could be higher. And with some software, you can take those right down to the item and inflate that item and then give an overall inflation rate for, for everything else. Yeah, if, you're, if you're, one of your goals is to um, make sure that your grandkids have monies to go to college, um, that's a high number. Yeah, college uh, expenses go up at twice the rate of inflation. Yeah. If, you, uh, if you don't have good medical insurance, uh -oh. you know, yeah, that's that's a high higher inflation number. If you're renting, probably you know uh, you've got a higher inflation number. So it's kind of personalized as well. It has to be. Yeah, you we bring up renting. That's a good point. I had clients who had sold their home and they were renting down in Orange County, and I said, you know, I know that that large um, rental company raises their rent 3% every year. And in a couple of years, you're not going to be able to afford that. And I, and I convinced them that they needed to buy a place with a fixed rate mortgage um, so that they could control their cost of living that way, their cost and, of housing. Know, it, there, there's so many 
financial decisions that you have to make throughout your lifetime. And nobody is there to be a, your coach, you know, to kind of um, uh, be objective and say, let's look at the, all the issues and, and make a mutually correct or what we think is the best decision for you. And sometimes yeah. they come to planners because the, 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 the partners or spouses are not quite in agreement. Now, everybody has some, some things that they don't agree on, but they really may be a little bit more polarized and they come to a neutral third party to kick it around. Yeah, well, number one reason for divorce is money. So- uh, yeah, It certainly could be, yeah. Yeah, let's go to your next slide. So, one of the things that we look at is Social Security, and Social Security gets taxed as well, correct? Um, federal, but not state, and it doesn't get taxed completely on the federal level. Exactly. You want me to bring up that tax sheet so we can see where it gets taxed? Sure. Okay, let me go back to that tax and, sheet. And one of the questions was, uh, what if I go ahead and bring that up, but what if I can't afford a, a, a fee-only financial advisor? Well, well you, you know, I think seminars like this are good. I think that there are really great groups now on um, the that, IFP. I mean, the FPA has a whole volunteer program. They have as well, a wonderful correct? FPA pro bono program that yeah. I encourage everybody to take advantage of. Yeah. And um, how, how would they get in hold of that program? If they go out to FPA pro bono dot org. OK they will find out exactly um, what that schedule is. We're in the midst of a series again. I think it's gonna start in another week or so. And it starts with, um, I believe it starts with credit and ends with buying a home. I think and, I'm the- it, I'm And incidentally, person. FPA stands for what? Oh, Financial Planning Association. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Don. Um, so there are programs there. Um, you meant banks are shopping centers. They're grocery stores for financial matters. All right. You don't go to a bank to get advice. Um, uh, um, most individuals at a bank are on some sort of a commission. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just at Wells Fargo uh, this last week, and I asked the person that was helping me whether or not they receive a commission if they um, recommend a mortgage broker or they recommend uh, me going to their financial person. He said, well, yeah, we used to get the uh, commission just for the referral, but now they have the person has to close you in order for us to get a commission. Um, I was at Bank of America, same way. They still give, if they refer someone to over to another individual within the bank, uh, they receive $100 for every referral. So uh, remember Keating. Uh, remember he was working out of, uh, out of a bank and Charles they Keating. were selling bonds. So banks are financial institutions that sell financial products from CDs to credit cards, mortgages, uh, investments, et cetera. Um, very few banks offer fee only, not fee based, fee only financial advice. Okay. Yeah, Social the bank, I, I had a student tell me that they even were getting pressure as an employee at a credit union. Yeah. Um, to credit sell. union is the same way. Yeah. They, you know, so anyway, Social Security, talk okay. about it. So here is a chart um, towards the right of the page that has social security on it. And it talks about the base amount of modified adjusted gross income that causes social security benefits to be taxable on the federal income tax side. So if you're married filing jointly and you have a modified adjusted gross income of 32,000, um, then 50% of your social security is added to that chart of taxable income. It's added to the pile. It's not a 50% tax rate. It's just added to the amount of income you have that year that's gonna be taxed. By the way, one of the things was this is, is that, uh, you know, if I don't have enough monies uh, to hire a 
uh, a financial advisor. Let me tell you, more money you make, the more complicated your life becomes. So, because you'll have tax issues, you'll um, there's more opportunity for choices. But uh, if you have a lot of money, it's more difficult to raise a child. Uh, it's kind of like if you there's a happy medium somewhere there where um, uh, uh, your wages meet your spending needs and 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 it's good to work. <laughs> so m- one of the things I, a lot of times I get is it says, can you recommend a financial advisor for me? And I go, well, what are some of the issues that you're dealing with? And it says, well, you know, I need to make more money. And then my question usually is, well, what do you do? And they said, well, I'm not working. <laughs> and so, you know, you, a financial advisor can't make money out of nothing for you. It's, uh, it's there for people who have a lot of money and it gets very, very complicated. And so, uh, um, Pete, Pete, those, yeah. Pete, let me back us up a minute. We talked about FPA and the site to go to if you want to look at what classes or other things might be available. What's the website for that? FPAProBono.org. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Sure. How much time do we have left, Don? About 30 minutes. Okay. Is this uh, more than an hour and a half? Oh, because we started a little later after Carl. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. I thought it was uh, 10 to 1130. A 10 to 1130. That's what we're doing. Oh, so we got 15 minutes. Okay. Don is incorrect. I like hearing that. Sorry, you were correct. Don was incorrect. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. just wanted to make that, sure I, because I've had, I've had a habit in the past of stopping this early. <laughs> so actually, I was trying to be gracious. No, yeah, we have well, 15 Don minutes. Is Thank almost you, Pete. perfect. But I love to catch him when he's not. So uh, let's go through this slide. What does this mean? Okay, so this is the nest egg or the pot of money that you're pulling from, in addition to maybe social security or pensions. This is the pot of money that you need to sustain various spending levels. So this isn't everything that you spend. This is when you turn to the investment pot and say, oh, after I get my social security and or pension, I need some extra money. So if you needed, for example, $100,000 before uh, before taxes, then depending on your rate of return on that, how it's invested, you would need, if you were very conservative and only getting 2% a year of rate of return on your portfolio, you'd need three and a half million dollars to give you that 100,000 a year. Um, similarly, if you wanted 150,000, you'd need 5.2 million at that rate of return, or 200,000, 6.9 percent million, 6.9 million. And we're assuming 3 percent inflation, and that you're going to need this money for 30 years. But if you could invest it just to get 5 percent, just 5 percent rate of return long term, then that 100,000, you only need 2.3 million. And I say only, you know, a lot of times clients come to me trying to plan for retirement and they go, I think I need another million. Um, But if you are fortunate enough to be investing at an 8% annual rate of return, that 100,000 could be had with just $1.6 million. You know, I think this chart is great for kids who are in their 30s and 40s because they have a hard time understanding the importance of saving and this chart kind of gives them that, hey, you, you need to save for retirement. Uh, yes. There's no pension plans any longer. Everybody has a 401k. And I find it so sad when people are not taking advantage of their 401k. No, they're not. I'll have younger people come in. They'll call me and they'll come in and they're maybe in their 20s or 30 and they'll say, Well, you know, I haven't really invested. I mean, of course, I have Bitcoin, but I haven't really invested yet. Mm. And I'm like, oh. Yeah. So one of the things I have a 32-year-old, and he definitely doesn't listen to me. (laughs) So I make sure that I recommend a fee-only advisor to him. And so that 
he can understand a little bit about the importance of savings and which he has. Good for him. But I think we all need to do that. And likely uh, a parent child, they don't listen to the parent, but they may listen to an outside authority such as a fee-only advisor. Yeah, neutral third party. Yeah. Neutral third party. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so this is all about 401k contributions, but a lot of times people aren't, uh, they're retired, so they're not making these contributions. Yeah, let's go to the next slide. Social security. Um, and viewers may already be receiving social security, but they, they probably know that the amount that they receive is based on their quarters of coverage and how much you earned while working. And definitely that it is one source of income that, that increases with inflation. I know there've been years where the increase has been zero or very small, and we're all waiting to hear what it's gonna be this year because we think it's gonna be larger, yeah. but it definitely goes up with inflation. And when a spouse dies, you wanna make sure that to check on it, whether or not you continue on your spouse's social security benefit or on your own social security benefit. Exactly. When a couple is receiving both their benefits and one of them dies, you get stepped up to the higher single amount. Um, so, you know, whoever's amount it was, it basically becomes that highest amount. It does, you don't get both. And, and in fact, when a death occurs between spouses that have been together, you know, 20, 30, 40, or 50 years, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're alone. Um, money issues are just amplified. Oh, yeah. And to me, a fee only advisor uh, is just invaluable during those periods to kind of guide you through uh, that period of time because you're going to be in a state of shock. And, and, and kids, if you have children, they're going to be telling you what to do. And, uh, you know, and they don't know any more about money than you more than likely, you know more than they do. So uh, yeah, I had a client come in who was a widow and her 35 year old son brought her in and he looked at me genuinely surprised saying, you know, I Googled how to settle in a state and I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, <laughs> just like, you know, changing title, uh, uh, changing social security, uh, pension plans with different banks, uh, titling different assets. It's just, it just goes on. And, and here you're trying to um, uh, just allow time to heal and get over the, the loss of the spouse. And you really know what's important to do and what you can put off. Yes. You know, some people might say, oh, it's time to invest in the stock market. You need to invest. And they, they, this is not the time to invest in the stock market. This is the time to get done only what you absolutely need to get done to settle the estate. Yeah. So, uh, uh, really important. Uh, I, again, and it's another. I look at a fee-only advisor um, uh, like a uh, primary care physician. Uh, uh, they, you come in, make sure your blood pressure is okay, your blood work is done, uh, it, it kind of a general checkup, and then if you have issues. Uh, hey, I want to buy down. Okay, let's get you some help in that area. Insurance is not adequate. Okay, let's get you some help in that area. Um, we need to do some tax planning. Okay, we need to, well, let's work in that area. Um, how about your estate plan? Do you work with people on estate plans? Oh, definitely. I work with them. I have accompanied clients to their meetings with attorneys. Definitely. I have said to them, I've identified things that we need to address. I make sure that they get to an attorney. And like I said, sometimes I'm there with them. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of times I'm thinking of a widow where it gave the widow and, and her oldest child a lot of comfort to have their planner there with them to make yeah. sure everything is done correctly uh, according to what their wishes are because they're, you know, the widow is just stunned after losing a spouse. Just yeah, the, yeah. and the other thing too is, 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 is that uh, men usually die first. And mm -hmm. so a lot of women um, are, are, are live longer and have to all of a sudden make all those decisions on their own. One of the things I recommend highly 
um, for many individuals is for fee-only financial advisors such as Delia to become what's called the trust protector and to give that particular power to your fee-only advisor to review your portfolio and also to have them give them the power to remove your trustee or to appoint a new trustee. And now you've got a neutral third party that has nothing else to do with your estate except to look after your own best interest in the event that you can't make decisions on your own, whether it's through Alzheimer's, dementia, a stroke, uh, whatever possibility could happen in your future. At least you know you got somebody there who's your trust protector besides your fee-only advisor. Yeah, you know, a lot of times couples will come in because one of them is running all of the finances. Let's say he's in charge, but he realizes that if something happens to him, his spouse is not going to be able to take over um, immediately and do what he does. And so they'll come in and say, we just want a review of the plan so that my wife knows we're on path and then that she has somebody that she can contact if something happens to me. Yeah. I have a close friend and it's the exact opposite. She's the accountant, runs all the money. He's a school teacher, has no clue about money whatsoever. And so the same kind of thing, you yeah. know, that uh, um, uh, you need to prepare. Uh, let's go to the next slide. We need to know all our passwords. Yeah. Yeah. So here's an idea of a normal retirement age and the dollar amount uh, when you would be getting your normal retirement age or full retirement age for Social Security based on your birth date. You know, it used to be 65 mostly for everybody, and then it changed in the early 80s. And so yeah. now after 1959, your full normal retirement age for Social Security is 67. Let's go to the next slide. I think most of us are retired who are watching the program, although we might have some younger people watching this on the video, which need, they need to know this. And there may be some people who are trying to decide whether they should wait or not for their social security. So they may be retired, but are thinking, well, I'm gonna wait and get that higher amount either at my full retirement age. And today that full retirement age maximum monthly benefit would be $3,113. Now I have a tip that I didn't put on the slide, but if you thought you were waiting for a particular age and then you decided you needed the money right away, um, you actually have the ability after age 62 and a half to say, you know, I should have filed six months earlier. I should have filed five months earlier. Well, you can call Social Security, roll back your start date up to six months and receive retroactive payments. Um, so if you thought you were going to wait until 67, but at 66 and a half, um, your spouse who was still working lost a job and you needed some money and you needed it right away, um, you can get it not by waiting until 67, but calling Social Security and saying, you know, I'm 67, but I really could use an extra six months of back pay. And so let's say that I started at 66 and a half and they'll give you a lump sum of retro pay. What does FRA mean? Full retirement age. Okay. Uh, let's go to, I think we're getting to the end, but let yeah, me- Yeah, we got three minutes. We got three minutes. Okay. So I'm not going to, uh, uh, we're going to stop on this particular slide wow. and I just want to- kind of go, go through what we've gone through already, which is basically the financial planning process. We got your, we know your net worth by now. If you don't, you need to know that yourself. Two, we understand your insurance needs. Are you properly insured? Do you have an umbrella policy? Three, do you understand what you spend on an annual basis. Big, big important item. Yeah. Do you know your tax bracket? So, you know, uh, and you should be doing some tax planning between now and at the end of the year. So, um, uh, and that's uh, where it can be good to sit down either with your planner or your tax person 
Um, I always like clients to have a tax person personally because I don't do taxes. Yeah. Um, and this is a good time to do some tax planning. Yeah. So after spending, you know, it's Delia is wonderful being a nag. Uh, so, you know, do you have your estate plan in order? You know, if something happens to you, uh, do you who's going to be taking care of you? <clears throat> do you have sufficient uh, uh, savings to handle your long term care needs? So um, estate planning becomes a real important aspect of uh, your financial plan. So what we're going to do next week is is going to we're going to talk about keeping all these things that we talked about today in mind. We're going to talk about investments. Yes. If you want to stop sharing for a minute. Uh, there is one question that I want to touch on here just to make sure that we, we all agree in terms of what this one is. So if, let me use an example of, so I have a power of attorney that I've issued. I have medical advanced health care directive issued. I have a massive heart attack. I'm alive. Can my children override that? C can your children- Can my children override the power of attorney or the medical care directive? If they're no. not the people listed. My assumption is no. No. Okay. No, it's it, if I die, it's different because that way it goes to whoever the, the well, you, you, your children can override it in the sense that you have if you have a major heart attack, you you are now incapacitated. Yes. And so somebody else will step in on your incapacity. So they can make decisions on your behalf that if, maybe, if I have a, if I have the medical care directive. And yeah. if I have the power of attorney, which are going through the incapacitation, yeah. then that stands. The children can't override it. No, they can't override it. But who, if you name your children in those oh, documents. Absolutely. But if I name somebody else, a yes. third party. Oh, if you okay. name somebody else, no, they can't. The only way would be if I died and they're the executors, then they would. Yeah, but or the successor trustee. Successor yeah. trustee. The power of attorney you. doesn't doesn't account when you. It dead. dies with me. Yeah, it dies yeah. With as, me. as does my health directive because I have no right. health. That's right. Okay. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, actually, I do. That's right. The burial is the issue. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. I know. Let's see. It's burial. It's the only it's power easy. that's left. Okay. One so. thing I'm going to do here at the moment is I'm going to stop the video that we are doing. <laughs>